Good morning and welcome back to the channel. My name's Andrew and it's really lovely to have you along today. Normally in the day job you'll see me getting grubby and doing all sorts of things, bashing houses, but today I've got something slightly different for you. And it starts with this rather delightful presentation box made by my son Chris. And, well, what does it contain? Let's have a look. So we start with a rather nice piece of black ribbon. And take that away. And lift the lid. And we see a rather nice silver pocket watch. And this came about, I was doing some work at a customer's, day job customer, and talking about uh, retirement activities, and I said I was going to repair, or I'm beginning to repair, pocket watches. Oh, she said. My husband's grandfather left him a pocket watch, which is in a bad state of repair, and could you possibly have a look at it for me? Yes, of course I can. And this is what we got. Well, ha, it wasn't like this. Let's just take it out of the box. There was no glass. Um, <clears throat> sorry, no crystal. It was heavily tarnished and um, generally in a really bad state. And uh, what can I do with it? Well, the brief was to replace the crystal, which I've done, clean it up, give it a cosmetic clean, have a look inside to see the state of the movement, and then decide what we can do. So, found a crystal, uh, found the crystal the right size, um, which actually turned out to be the wrong size because the bezel is distorted. Um, at some point it's been dropped, and I think that little dimple, you see that little dimple, was the impact point. And it's um, broken the face. Let's, let's see if we can get in there. See that? I see all those cracks. Uh, the face is enamel on copper. And although very durable, it's actually very brittle. And uh, it's sort of shattered it. The customer decided she didn't want to replace the face, although that could be done. Um, because it's part of the history of the watch, and I agree. The movement itself um, is pretty straightforward. It's a fusé uh, movement. And if we open this up carefully here, you can see the dust cover and the top of the balance cock. And if I just remove the dust cover with this little catch, we can see the movement and what you have here is the balance wheel and if we look inside you begin to see the movement itself and it's a a no brand movement my apologies i don't wish to do it as a disservice but it uses a fusée chain and comb to wind it up now, on modern movements, you directly wind the mainspring. On older movements, what you're doing is winding this cone, which has a chain on it, which then winds up the mainspring. And because it's a cone, it, the tightness of the mainspring balances out the um, dimensions and shape of the cone on the fusée, and that allows constant pressure on the mainspring. Um, it wasn't working. Uh, a couple of the hands came off, the minute hand and the second hand came off very easily. And um, on investigating, uh, I found a number of things. Firstly, the jewel on the top of the balance wheel um, is actually cracked and I've got a picture uh, that I took under the microscope to show you this. So this is the underside of the balance cock and the jewel is the larger circle in the middle and the sort of white grey disc uh, with four radial lines is the jewel that the uh, tiny pivot uh, rotates in 
and basically, although that's a diamond, it has actually broken. And because there is so little um, energy going through um, the balance wheel, enough to make the watch run, um, it's impeding it greatly. And um, I wasn't going to replace that um, because trying to find one to fit exactly this movement mm, might not be the easiest. What I was able to do, however, um, although there's quite a few service marks on the inside of the dust case, um, nothing since about 1944 as best I can identify. What I was able to do was to, without taking the movement apart, to lubricate it. Um, initially it ran, um, but it was kind of limping along. It was a very uneven tick. Um, but over time it has evened up quite a bit to the point now where it ticks quite nicely. The movement itself was said to be overwound. Now you can't actually do that. You can't overwind um, a watch. What happens is that when you wind up a, a mainspring so tightly that you can't wind it anymore, what you have is all the laminations of the spring all touching each other and if there's no lubrication between those leaves, then the friction, the metallic friction between them, can't be overcome by the power of the spring, and it won't unwind. And I believe that to be the case here. So, wiggling and jiggling, I managed to get it to run, and with a bit of lubrication, it has now fully unwound the uh, mainspring. So, the... Um, the case itself uh, is sterling silver. I've got a little bit of video that I did on the micro under the microscope just to show you the um, hallmarks in more detail because on this camera you can't quite see them. So let's have a look at that now. So under the microscope we have a clear view of the hallmarks. And there's quite a few things to uh, learn from these if you're not familiar with hallmarks. Uh, the first thing, sort of top to bottom, is the lion, and that means that this is sterling silver. And in itself, that means that this silver is 92.5% pure. The rest of the material in it would probably be copper. Beneath that, you have the maker's serial number, and to the right of that is a hole where the winder key would go in. So going down, you have a row of three uh, emblems. Um, on the left is what looks like a shield, but it's actually a leopard's head, uncrowned. And that, at the time, was the assay mark for London. In the middle, there's a number seven, or what looks like a number seven. Don't know what that is. And on the right is a letter G in a shield, capital letter G, and that is the date mark for 1882. Each year has a unique date mark, and in London these would go back to 1558, uh, but this, in this instance it's 1882. Below that we have the maker's mark, uh, AWRG stands for Albert Waterfall and Robert Gravener, who at the time were working out of Coventry. They would have sent this watch case and probably a whole bunch of others down to London to be assayed, which means that the purity of the material is determined and if it meets the specification, gets the uh, sterling silver mark. I've also seen their work with a Chester assay office mark on, which is three sheaves of corn. So uh, there we go, hallmarks. Okay, and so all it requires now is a finished polish, just because it's got my grubby finger marks all over it, and popping back in the presentation case and taking back to the customer. 
This watch itself, although it's a sterling silver case, is what I call an everyday watch. It's the sort of watch you would wear to work and with you all the time. And the reason I know it's been used a lot is because of the wear around the outside of the engine turning. And this would typically go to the uh, to this rim. Um, but because it's been in and out of the pocket about a million times, probably more, then it's worn away because, as we know, silver is quite soft. Um, but notwithstanding that, it's a nice watch. Um, it has a nice chain with a buttonhole bar. There was no winder with it, so I provi provided a key. It's a number four um, Swiss pattern, I think. Um, and that will allow you to alter the time in the front and then wind it up in the back. Um, so this was made, let's say, 1890. Um, the movement, I can't identify where that's from. Might be English, it might be Swiss. Um, but a nice watch. Um, just a shame it was dropped. But that's part of the history of the watch and part of the history of the people who've owned it. So uh, thank you for watching, <laughs> pardon the pun, and um, let's uh, see where we get to on the next one.